Welcome to the SVG TV Evening News for today, Monday, March 8th. I'm Khalil Cato with the details. St. Vincent and the Grenadines joins the rest of the world today to celebrate International Women's Day under the theme, Women in Leadership Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. The day is used to celebrate the achievements of women socially, politically, economically, culturally, and in all other spheres of life. In an address to mark the occasion, Minister of National Mobilization and Gender Affairs, Orlando Brewster, salutes the women of SVG and specifically highlighted those in Parliament. A contributor to the more equal COVID-19 world is increasing women's access to leadership roles. And although women still face a significant cultural, socio-economic, and political barrier to accessing leadership, we must recognize and give accolades to those women who would have recently assumed leadership position for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. They include Her Excellency Dame Susan Duggan, Governor General of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Honorable Rochelle Ford, Speaker of the House of Assembly, the Honorable Senator Kisal Peters, Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, National Security, Legal Affairs and Information, the Honorable Senator Ashel Morgan, Deputy Speaker of the House of Assembly, and the Honorable Senator Siobhan John, Opposition Senator for the New Democratic Party. In Minister Brewster says that the pandemic has resulted in numerous challenges for women who continue to beat the odds pre-existing social and systematic barriers to women participating in leadership, new challenges have emerged with the COVID-19 pandemic as across the world women are facing increasing domestic violence, unpaid care duties, unemployment and poverty. It has also impacted women and girls in profound ways, amplifying the inequalities they face every day. Therefore, it is fundamental that women, voices and experiences are central to the response and recovery plans. This year, 2021, was greeted with a triple threat. One, the COVID-19 pandemic. Two, the dreaded dengue fever. And three, the effusive eruption at La Safra volcano. They have impacted on our economy. The Gender Affairs Minister also spoke of the female frontline workers and commended them for their work during the pandemic. He made special mention of Chief Medical Officer Dr. Simone Kieser Beach. Women continue to stand at the front line of the COVID-19 crisis as healthcare workers, security officers, social workers, caregivers, innovators, and community organizers. This shows exemplary and effective leadership skills in combating this pandemic. This crisis has highlighted the importance of their contribution and how multifaceted they are in performing their duties. However, they are still particularly affected by the heightened pressure on the healthcare system and are subject to acute and high-risk working conditions, which further increase the risk for infection among a majority female workforce. Notable mention must be made of Dr. Simone Kieser Beach, the Chief Medical Officer and Chair of the Health Services Subcommittee on the COVID-19 Task Force of the National Emergency Management Committee. She has contributed tremendously and relentlessly her hard work has been shown in the fight against COVID-19 in St. Vincent. Coordinator of Gender Affairs in the Ministry of National Mobilization, Lafur Kwame, also wishes all women in SVG and across the world a happy International Women's Day. As part of the day's celebration, Kwame said that the division will be collaborating with the Caribbean Institute for Women in Leadership, St. Vincent and the Grenadines Chapter, for a virtual meeting this evening at 7 p.m. Under the sub-theme, Salute to the Capeless Sheroes. Why we say that? Because in a COVID-19 world, the pandemic in which we are in this, um, this year and last year, we started last year, we recognize that females, they comprise a large amount of the, um, the frontline workers, those essential workers who no matter rain come or sunshine, they have to go out to work because they have a duty to the people the poor, the marginalized, and the vulnerable population. So we say that 
the women in these sectors, we would be recognizing them. So the nurses, the female nurses, the female doctors, those who are in the security forces, the police officers, female police officers, those who are in the social sectors, those social workers, the psychologists, these persons we are recognizing today. Kwame said that while 70% of, of females are in leadership positions in the public service, there is not an equal share of women in parliament and politics who are involved in policy making. This made us to the contribution of women in society. We seem to find that there is a disparity. There is a gap a gender gap as it relates to women in leadership position, especially in politics. While in the public sector and the public service, we have over 70% of the managers, heads of divisions, heads of departments, they are run by women. We find when it comes to the policy decision um, level, those at the cabinet or even in parliament, those who are responsible for making the laws and policies here in St. Vincent and Grandines, we see the disparity. We see the gap. We do not see an equal share at the table where that is concerned. So that's one of the positions that Gender Affairs Division has taken from 2021 and going forward, where we are going to invest significantly in a woman in leadership program, targeted women in communities and those girls in the secondary and even tertiary level um, education because they are our future. The Gender Affairs Coordinator also encourages women to stand up and let their voices be heard more. She said females must also take their education very seriously, noting that everyone can become successful once they put their minds to it. Should be seen and not be heard. So that would have, you know, um, held down some females, you know, over the, the past couple of years and so forth. But what I would encourage young girls and women to do is to stand up and speak out. Let your voices be heard. You should be able to challenge the status quo and say that this is not right, this is not what I want, and be able to contribute to the discussion, contribute to the decisions that may affect your lives. And one way in which that can happen is if you can be able to take the educational opportunity. Because with the advancement of your education, you can be able to know what's going on and add your voice to the discussion. Because today's ceiling can be tomorrow's flows. So we have to work towards that. My name is Lafleur Kwame, and I choose to challenge for International Women's Day. Kwame, Kwame said it is also important that women in leadership positions be a support and encouragement to others. The National Council of Women also joined the celebration of International Women's Day today. In an address to mark the occasion, President Beverly Richards said that more should be done to celebrate Vincentian women and called on women in society to make a concerted effort to do better as they celebrate International Women's Day 2021. All around the world, 20 years ago, the internet was something that one could only imagine. Now, things have advanced so much that we are able to interact with other people who we do not know. We have seen and watched and observed how there are people who have built their own companies from the ground up. We have seen people develop skills and talents and that they are being exhibited through the internet. Everything in its original state is positive. It is only when it gets distorted that negativity comes about. Yes, we know that there are things that are being done with the internet that is not glorifying that is not honorable, it is dishonorable. We've heard about TikTok challenges. We've heard about people who have lost their lives as a result of the... Richard said that everyone should seek to empower women and girls to take control, to be treated with respect and dignity, and to be protected from all forms of violence. We have to accept and realize that we make decisions on the basis of the information that we have. And therefore, I think it's important as females to not blame ourselves for decisions we make that end up becoming harmful or even destructive because we only had certain information available to us. And when I say this, I think about women who enter into relationships with an abusive partner, who date and maybe go on to marry a person who subjects them to domestic violence, 
we have to accept and realize domestic violence comes in different forms. And often when a person has experienced abuse in their younger years, it is very difficult for them to walk away, to develop that strength and courage to walk away from a later abusive or exploitative relationship. Dr. Doris Charles, a former worker at the High Commission in London and other working class women in SVG, including some from the Ministry of National Mobilization, also took the opportunity today to encourage other women in leadership positions to look out for one another and to continue to empower others. It means the liberation from total domination by men. Women are recognized for their hard work in terms of child rearing, in terms of assisting their partners, in terms of breadwinning. Looking after your family means that your community is being developed. Your community developed means that your country or your island, wherever you're from, are also developed. Strong women not only feel pain, they accept it, they learn from it, and they fight through it. They turn their wounds into wisdom. They take a break to shed a tear, but after they get back up and dust themselves off, they fight like they have never fought before. So again, let me say happy international Women's Day. You are placed in a community in a very unique position, one that in your sphere of endeavor you are going to be leaders. Or if you're not going to be leaders, somehow you're going to be change agents. Um, and just do your best. And once again, congratulations on being who you are, being the best that you are. Be and do the best that you can. SVG recorded five new COVID-19 cases for the weekend period. One new case was recorded on Friday and four on Saturday. The number of total recoveries now stands at 1,200, that should be 1,027. 628 cases remain active and eight persons with COVID-19 have died. 1,663 cases of COVID-19 have been reported in St. Vincent and the Grenadines since March 2020. The public is urged to use a mask sanitize, physically distance, and get vaccinated to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in the country. The walking vaccination site at the Victoria Park will once again be open all this week from 9 a.m. daily. And the national vaccination drive continued over the weekend at various locations island-wide. At the Calioqua playing field on Sunday, area representative and Minister of Finance Camilo Gonzalez, along with his wife, were among those who took the opportunity to get vaccinated. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Simone Kieser Beach, who was on hand to ensure the activity flowed smoothly, reported that since the rollout of the vaccination program, more than 5,000 Vincentians have already been vaccinated. The official count was around 5,023. However, that, that's the, because of the nature of the data we are collect, collecting, those are the figures for the verified yes. numbers. So those figures don't include the 231 we saw in Victoria Park yesterday. They don't include the over 200 we saw in Georgetown yesterday. The 67, I think 63 is in um, Chateaubelair. Um, so, you know, and we've also been doing private sector going to persons. So that 5,000 is not the total, but it is, you know, it's the verified number. I'll say thank you on behalf of the team. And that's what we are a team of resilient, focused healthcare workers and our partners because without our partners it can't be done. Speaking after receiving his first dose of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine, Finance Minister Gonzalez said that he was pleased with the turnout of his constituents. He said that being vaccinated helps with ensuring the safety of all Vincentians in this period of COVID-19. I honestly did not even feel the, the needle. Um, I, I don't like to look at needles. I wasn't looking at when it happened, but I was looking away and I didn't feel when it happened. But absolutely fine. So I'm looking forward to the passage of the weeks um, between now and my second dose. Um, and I know that I will be safer and my family will be safer, my neighborhood will be safer, my constituency will be safer, my country will be safer if as many of us get vaccinated as possible. But Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez was also at the vaccination drive and said that he would like to see more frontline workers taking the vaccine, especially teachers. 
Yes. And they went back way at the um, almond tree. At the almond tree. And so on and so forth. I think more and more people are coming on to it. I want to see the the teachers. Um, because we, we really need to open back the schools. The the positivity rate is, is, is quite low now because the masks uh, um, and social distances, physical distances having some impact. Um, the testing is is going well. You know, it's fairly efficient now. There's no backlog to talk about. Um, and the only problem we had over the last week or so was, was at um, mental health and that seems to be contained. The Milton Cato Memorial Hospital has a COVID-19 medical unit which is being headed by a female staff nurse, Sister Carmelita Cordes. On this International Women's Day, we look at what it's like to be on the front line dealing with COVID-19 patients. Larissa Pugsley-Kidd spoke with some of the hardworking females in the COVID-19 medical unit today and filed this report. Here is where the nurses station. So when we go up to the unit, mm -hmm. so we come here and we do all our to accommodate the number of persons seeking care for COVID-19 at the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital, the female ward was transformed into a COVID-19 medical unit. It sits here, so we try to reduce the amount of time. We do isolated care. So we go out to take care of the patient, we use time. We do cluster care and then we come back here and we do all our documentation. We learned that at one point there were 17 patients at the unit, which required the nurses to take extra precaution, including personal protective equipment, PPEs, which are highly recommended for all nurses and doctors on the front line. Nurse Carmelita Cordes manages the unit and said that there are eight nurses working on the ward. She said initially there was a level of fear among the nurses having to deal with the COVID-19 patients. It was a scary moment, especially for my staff, but I was there cheering them on all the way. And the challenges were really real. I saw patients who were so distressed. Some of them didn't make it, but we were there to support them all the way. And the most challenge we faced was basically they couldn't, the relatives couldn't visit them. To date, eight persons have died from COVID-19 in SVG, and according to Sister Cordes, it was not easy losing these patients. So we, we sang with them. There were times where we sang with them, we cried with them. One of the young staff nurses is Faisha Lewis, who started to work at the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital in November last year. Nurse Lewis said the experience is a challenging one, which she welcomes. And if a patient goes in distress, we can't run to them like how we could run to a regular patient. We have to put on the necessaries to go out there. I think it was fearful. But walking along here, and we had cases where persons end up being positive on other wards. Here you know that they are positive and you could take all the precautions to prevent yourself from contracting the disease. No nurse in this unit has contracted COVID-19, and they gave God thanks. Presently, Sister Cordy said only persons with underlying conditions are sent to the COVID-19 unit. We had us all as 89 patients that was here, 94. We had, we had as young as three months old. We had a four-year-old. We had pregnant women who came to here. And when we had those 17, it was very challenging for very, very challenging because all, most of the patients, you have to take, you have to do everything for them. Feed them, everything, you have to do everything. So it was very stressful initially. But right now we are down to two patients and they, we do not send home a patient unless the patient has somewhere they can isolate properly at home. They are medically fit for home. The hospital administrator is Grace Walters, a woman who has been making decisions for her staff whether it is to ensure there is adequate gears or just looking out for their well-being. Walters, like anyone else in a leadership position, face many challenges. The challenges at the workplace um, sometimes is based on um, Mrs. X or Mrs. Y was tested positive, but we had already seen her. Luckily, we had on a mask and so forth and so on. So it's not that we're just taking everybody 
at face level anymore. We still have to secure our own lives and our own, um, we have to ensure that our colleagues are also safe. The theme for International Women's Day is Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. The women here have proven the theme right by choosing to face the challenges head-on in a COVID-19 world. Taking care of the COVID-19 patient, it was to me, it was a joy because I got to touch the lives of so many people who needed the nurses at a time when they really needed that support. For SVG TV News, Larissa Pogsley-Kid. Some news now on the Lasso Fair volcano. Dr. Roderick Stewart, who is now the lead scientist monitoring the volcano, said over the next two weeks they will be seeking to build local monitoring capacity. Dr. Stewart said so far four volunteers have been trained as seismologist technicians. The, the key focus is to actually train up some volunteers to do basic monitoring of the seismic of the earthquake data whilst I'm not here. So they can run the equipment, they can watch things, and then I can support them from months around because with the internet these days, yeah, I can see the computers, I, I can do things. So buying people in and out, but it's not easy with the coronavirus. Right. But we, we have to have local capacity. So there's those volunteers. And we already have some local capacity in the electronic side. There are a couple of employees at Nemo that are dedicated to the volcano monitoring. And I'm pretty sure um, Nemo and the government are looking to build this capacity. So I think that's really the, the, the big thing I'll be working on is local capacity building. Okay. According to Dr. Stewart, who is a seismologist, his analysis thus far of the, effusive of the effusive eruption of the new lava dome is that it is not likely to, there is not likely to be an explosive eruption anytime soon based on the measurement of the pressure coming from the dome. Continue to be effusive. It, it, it's growing slowly. This lava is coming out. I think the average rate is about two cubic meters per second, which if you want a comparison, the average fridge is two cubic meters, so it's a fridge of material every second. But it's very quiet in, in the, what it is doing. Although we are reporting a large number of sort of earthquakes or seismic events, these are very, very small seismic events, and there's none. They're all associated with the dome. They're, they're all at the surface. There's no sign of any pressurization or any forcing from below our seismic and our GPS monitoring are, are not showing any major pressurization of, of the volcano. So it, it's flowing quite freely at the moment. Dr. Stewart said that the weather conditions have been posing some challenges in getting measurements, but that they're exploring other options to ensure that the measurements are taken. But the danger is that this might change. It may start showing some pressurization and that's why we've got all the monitoring in place. Or the other danger is, of course, if the dome continues to grow, it will eventually overflow the edges of the crater, and, and that brings out another level of hazard. So it, it's very interesting to, to watch, but there's a lot of things that could happen, and we have to be very, very wary of what's going on. I think I visit yesterday, but the weather, especially in the morning, it was terrible. I did try to point out to the team that, you know, people are waterproof, they, they can work in the rain, but it's actually very dangerous going up in, in bad weather. The trail is very slippy. If you're carrying equipment, there's dangers of accidents. We've already had one person turn an ankle going up there. Mm -hmm. and, and also, it's just very difficult to do a lot of the measurements. When Omnibus operators across St. Vincent and the Grenadines today unified to withdraw their services once again in a bid to pressure the government into creating more favorable stipulations for them to operate under this period of COVID-19. Speaking with SVG TV News in Bel Air today, several operators from the area explained their plight. Rail and Chule in Bel Air will be basically unified and we have been trying to go along with the protocols for the longest while. But you see, we see on the placard disrespect disrespect and harassment now nah, we have enough of that man what are you calling we old van if they are old van we here and go by some old van and put them on the road car disrespect we like that watch we carry more than 80 percent i walk in public to and from the walk every day 
How we ain't unify? Well, if you say we ain't unify, we shouldn't tell you that we unify. Well, we sacrificing all the time. This is another sacrifice we're willing to take because it's not fair. We've taken a stand here today and telling them how we feel and we're going to prolong this as long as possible. One operator speaking on behalf of his colleagues expressed frustrations with the conditions attached to the $500 subsidy and said the government should instead increase passenger capacity in order for them to meet their operating expenses. When I come, when I check it out, four days per week, at the end of the month, it's just like $31 and some cents. If they, anybody have 10 permits to work for that, I won't. I'm self-employed, why should I work for that? Yes. Secondly, yes, he's right. dictating us. You have enough to be on the road four days out of five days, which means he's demanding us because of what? Civil servants need to get to work Monday to Friday, basically. So it will not affect the service. Oh, so therefore, if I have to add a part and it take me a month, I cannot get his money. It's totally unacceptable. It's best to carry up back our capacity, he keep his money and work for our money. Teachers working for him, police working for him, nurses working for him. They cannot take a salary cut. We're not working for him. Why should you take the last? It's best to just come for the van. I will stay home. Because you go to work, you have put food on the table, you have family, you have a mortgage overhead, maybe living in the rent. I don't know, right? We have other expenditures, and people are going on like minibus man making millions. Yeah. Another operator shared what he called the confusing conditions under which they are being ticketed. He alleged that operators are being ticketed for carrying the above the stipulated capacity, even with a child, as well as for passengers who are not wearing their face masks correctly. They said kids under the age of six would be exempted from this. You have eight adults in your van and two children under the age of six and you're still being ticketed for that why, why did you not say that two one any, hmm? any. two one anything you have in your van a child and you have eight adults you're still being ticketed for that imagine somebody going down in your van they have before they enter your van they have a mask on but somehow police stop you and the person may have the mask by the remote they saw they're going to charge you for that how am i responsible for that and I, at this day, it's actually happening. Hmm? How, how, how am I responsible day, for that? Every day. So, I mean, they, they're just trying to suck the money out of us somehow. We, we, we hardly make any money. A call for support from the public was also made by a passionate operator who alleged that the current regulations appear to be more of a money-making effort. About making money. If they want to make money, all the free parking in town. Let, 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 let every person who have free parking in town pay $5. And at the end of the day, see how much money they make. That Instead of targeting, targeting honest van man who go out on a daily basis from 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning to weigh hours in the night, transporting people around. This is our living. Many of us only know minibus operator because this is our career. This is our job. And we love what we do with a passion, serving the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I urge the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines traveling with us to hear our cry, feel our pain, see that it's totally, totally wrong and disrespectful. Operators say they plan to continue to withdraw their service until better conditions are implemented. In a telephone interview with SVG TV News, the president of the Vincentian Transportation Association, Vintas Royron Adams, confirmed that the strike action is under the directive of the organization following consultations with members. What you're seeing here is um, motivated and designed from the leadership of Vintas and, and driven an influence by the request from the membership. Well, first and foremost, we expected to get a response from the government in writing as promised by the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. He gave us the assurance that the Cabinet Secretary would send us a formal response in writing. We have not received any such thing. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, 
I received a call from the Prime Minister informing me of the government's decision to provide subsidy. And with that information came the advisory of the conditions. Those conditions meant that every operator need to be on the road for four out of the five weekdays during the period which the subsidy would be granted. That would qualify members and operators to receive such subsidy. Quite naturally, when I impart those information to the membership, the conditions are considered to be punitive and onerous. Adam said the operators cannot continue to operate at a loss, noting that they are being required to provide their service for at least four days per week in order to be eligible to receive the $500 subsidy from government. According to the Vintas president, this is an unrealistic expectation given the nature of omnibus operation. public transportation business that don't give you notice when you have a mechanical problem, you know. And you can develop a simple great fluid leak but keep you off the road for two or three days. And whilst I heard the Prime Minister saying that consideration would be given to members who have decided to utilize the time to do major repairs and are off the road for mechanical reasons, the challenge with that is that there is no objective way of determining that. It is also alleged that operators must remain ticket-free in order to receive the subsidy. Adams said while he has no official documentation of such, it is a strong perception from the operators and he would not be surprised if it proved to be an additional condition. According to Adams, Vintas has emailed correspondence to the government detailing updated requests for its members, including sanitization booths in Georgetown, Union Island and Beckway, a lavatory in Georgetown, and no conditions attached, and no conditions attached to receiving the promised subsidy. He says to date, no response has been given. Meanwhile, head of the traffic department of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force, Superintendent Kenneth John, responded to the allegations by the omnibus operators that children are being included in the eight-passenger capacity and operators are being ticketed for passengers who may not be wearing their masks correctly while on board. Superintendent John said he has received no complaints of children being counted as part of the eight-person capacity on omnibuses, and clarified how the public health law navigates the issue of a child passenger. Brought to my attention, I know once there are big, big, um, big portions in the van, I know they are ticketed for the, 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 the bigger portions and not, the, and not necessarily children. The law is clear in it because it is saying, I think it's under four, six, six years, then they're not allowed to wear masks. And then according to the traffic act, persons under the age of 10. Two persons under the age of 10 is reckoned as one. On the issue of the incorrect wearing of masks by passengers, Superintendent John said that according to the law, operators can in fact be ticketed for a non-compliant passenger, even if that individual was wearing their mask correctly upon, initial, upon initially boarding the omnibus. Get a ticket also for, for the, 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 the passenger not wearing their mask. The light is very clear in it. And also that, that person was wearing the mask under the <coughs> under the chin, they can also get a ticket because the owner is also easy or responsibility to to, um, to wear your mask. But remember that the driver is the po the driver is the one responsible for every person, everything that happened with that vehicle. While omnibus operators are lamenting that they are being hunted by the police. SOP John said that operators are disregarding the law, noting that he has heard of cases where operators were repeatedly ticketed before arriving to their destinations, and as they continue to carry the over the stipulated capacity despite earlier infractions while on their journey. Three, four, up to 18 passengers still. And because, because I believe they have knowledge that um, we, did, we didn't have the ticket books in place at the time. So all that we were doing was to just ask the conductor or the driver to eject the excess passengers. But now that we receive the tickets book, then we have, there have been issued tickets for the violation. And let me tell you again, because we have placed po police in different locations, you realize some of these vans, 
been getting tickets. One trip going to Georgetown, and they'll get it three tickets from Kingston to Georgetown. If you just get a ticket for excess passengers at Arnesville, why should you get another ticket in Kerioqua for the same offense? That means you don't concern about the, the law. Police officers have turned out in their numbers since they received the ticket books, which support the Public Health Act 2020 on Wednesday, March 3rd. Marika Batiste of the St. Vincent Girls High School captured the top prize of the, of the U.S. Embassy's fourth annual Black History Month secondary school speech competition. The competition is held annually in February in recognition of Black History Month. This year, secondary school students from across Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean were invited to give outstanding speeches on leadership and how women of color have broken through barriers to achieve success. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this year's competition expanded the field of participants beyond Barbados to the Eastern Caribbean and featured the submission of recorded videos. From a competitive pool of entries from, the se from seven countries, the speech by the 15-year-old GHS student shone brightly. Marika reportedly gave a passionate explanation of the importance of the role of women in politics, challenging the women of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to not just blindly follow the rules, but to be involved in making them. Marika took home a prize package Marika took home a prize package valued at 1,000 U.S. dollars, comprising a tech suite, which included a laptop, a printer, Bluetooth speaker, wireless mouse, and a 64-gig flash drive, along with trophy and books. Along with a trophy and books, she also won a desktop computer for her school. The embassy said the contest honored Black History Month and supported its commitment to education to drive sustainable economic growth, foster innovation, and empower youth.